Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture number two on taxation where we are going to have a discussion on income tax. In this lecture, we are going to have a number of things here. In our outline, we are going to give a definition of income tax. We are going to look at the various sections of the Income Tax Act, Cap 340. Uh, we are going to have uh, a discussion on imposition of income tax. We are going to have a discussion on some of the key terms like chargeable income, gross income, person, year of income. All right, going into the lecture, we are asking ourselves, what is income tax? So income tax, we are saying here, refers to the tax that is imposed on a person is a taxable income. So it is a tax charged on income that has been derived by a person, in other words. In the second part, you are saying that the income tax is administered under the Income Tax Act, Cap 340. And we continue by saying that the Income Tax Act, of course, before I forget, uh, all students, you're required to at least have the latest uh, or the updated Income Tax Act of this financial year. So uh, I request that you ensure that you have a copy of this because we are going to be making reference to the Income Tax Act. So we are saying that the Income Tax Act, Cap 340, commenced on the 1st of July, 1997. The second bullet we are saying the act is divided into parts and sections with schedules and uh, subsidiary legislation. In total, our act has 17 parts, 166 sections, and 7 schedules. I'm going to highlight that. We are saying that in total, the act has 17 parts, 166 uh, sections and the seven schedules and we are continuing by saying that there are three subsidiary we have three subsidiary legislations that will accompany our act all right we move into imposition of income tax so here we are addressing the fact that how are we supposed to know that indeed we are supposed to pay this kind of tax. According to section 4, subsection 1 of the Income Tax Act, we are saying a tax to be known as income tax shall be charged for each year of income, okay, for each year of income underlined here, and is hereby imposed on every person who has chargeable income for the year of income so each year a person who has chargeable income is supposed to pay this type of tax which we are saying is our income tax so the question is if you're talking about a year what are we looking at how many months if you're talking about a person who are we looking at here if you're talking of chargeable income because all these are unique words the act ought to have defined each of these. Indeed, the act has defined this. So let's move into some of the key terms. Definition of key terms. Chargeable income. According to section 15 of the act that I've requested you to, 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 to possess, chargeable income of a person for their of income refers to the gross income of the person for their of income, less total deductions that are allowed under the Act. That is gross income, the person, less total deductions. So if I'm to write here, I'm saying chargeable income is equal to the gross income minus the deductions. Okay? deductions allow we shall see where our deductions are located in the act so that's the nice formula there chargeable income is equal to gross income minus deductions 
that are allowed in the act. Of course, the word allowed is also important here. The deductions that are allowed by the act. So, of course, we are saying, what is gross income for that matter? According to section 17 of the Income Tax Act, gross income refers to the total amount of the following. The business income. Okay. Employment income. Property income. Derived during the year by a person other than the income exempt from more from tax. So we, we basically add all these. What we get here is actually our gross income. That is our gross income down there as our total. We continue by saying that according to section 17, subsection 2 of the Act, for the purposes of subsection 1, the gross income of the resident person, we are going to see who is a resident person, includes income derived from all geographical sources and the gross income of a non-resident person, we are going to see who is a non-resident person, includes only income that has been derived from sources that are located in Uganda. Okay? Whereas the resident persons, we charge income derived from all geographical sources, which you call worldwide uh, sources, worldwide income. For the case of non-residents, we are going to see in our definition, we only charge tax on the uh, income that has been derived from sources in Uganda. So who is a person for that matter? According to section 2, which has almost all the definitions in the Act, according to section 2, a person is defined to include an individual, a partnership, a trust, a company, retirement fund, government, or a political subdivision of government, and a listed institution. So, plainly, we cannot say that a person is a human being, no. It is wider than that. A person will include an individual, a partnership, a trust, a company, a resident fund, government, a political sub a subdivision of government, and a listed institution. Where well, we have the uh, we have our difference there. So we continue the second bit by saying that, as observed in section seventeen, a person can be either resident or the person may be nani resident. So straight away, we are asking ourselves, who is a resident person? So we are saying in the first bit that resident status of a person is determined in relation to the year of income. A person may therefore be a resident in one year, and they may not be a resident the following year, or they may be non-residents in another year. And the second bit we are saying that resident status of a person can be categorized according to the nature of the person for tax purposes, as in the slides that uh, that follow. And according to Section 9 of the Income Tax Act, a resident individual is the individual who fulfills the following. One, has a permanent home in Uganda. Two, has no permanent home but was present in Uganda for a period or periods amounting to 183 days okay, or more during the year under consideration. Number two, for any period during the year of income under consideration and in the two preceding years of income for period averaging 122 days for three years. So what we do, we shall get the number of days you've stayed in Uganda for the last three years and then get the average. If the average is more than 122 days, then indeed you are considered a resident individual for tax purposes. We continue by saying a resident individual is also regarded as an employee or official of government, okay, 
and real official government posted abroad during their income. A typical examples of those are ambassadors and other government representatives. So we note here that an individual for the purposes of this section refers to a natural human being. We have an exercise here, 2.1. Uh, of course, we are saying that Okero and Okumu are citizens of South Africa. They visited Uganda in 2017 and 2019. So information is here in our of days, how they stayed in Uganda. And we are required to establish the resident status of each individual uh, for the years and give reasons for your answer. So the answers have already been provided in the notes. I want you to go to the notes and look at the answers given there. If you don't understand any of these, kindly let me know in your post. Other issues to consider include an individual must be physically present in Uganda to be considered a resident for that year of income. If an individual has a permanent home in Uganda and physically appears in Uganda even for a single day, he is deemed to be a resident for that year. So we are saying an individual must be physically present in Uganda for them to enjoy the resident status. So if you have a permanent home in Uganda and you physically appear in Uganda, even if it is a single, only one day, you'll be deemed to be resident for that particular year of income and you pay taxes as per the uh, rates uh, put forward for resident individuals. We continue with the study question by asking ourselves, does an individual without a house uh, be deemed to have a home is it only having a house or something can work as uh, as a home so in our session here we are saying that in commissioner general of income tax versus narundini hasanali uh, Hassan norani guidelines to interpretation of a home were given as follows one a home does not necessarily mean a house bungalow or flat but could even be a hotel, a hotel room, or a cave. Two, an individual could have more than one home, and one could be uh, one could be abroad. Three, the home may be rented or owned. Four, the home must be available for at least part of the year. The individual must have full control of the home. In the home, one would expect to find the family and the personal belongings. The home is to be a substantial, uh, is to a substantial degree, also by individual or his family. So uh, we are moving into a <coughs> resident company, and we are saying that according to Section Ten of the Income Tax Act, a company is said to be resident. Okay, I'm going to highlight all these. I'm saying that a company is said to be a resident. Uh, that is in our section number 10. If it is incorporated, incorporated or formed under the laws of Uganda. Number two, if its management and control is exercised in Uganda at any time during the year of income. And then three, <coughs> undertakes the majority of its operations in Uganda during the year of income. So, <clears throat> I'm going to say that a, comp uh, a resident trust, according to section 11 of the Income Tax Act, a trust is resident for the year of income if it is established in Uganda. At any time during the year of income, a trustee of the trust was a resident person. And then three, management and control of the trust is exercised in Uganda at any time during the year of income. Next, we have the resident partnership, and we're saying, according to Section 12 of the Income Tax Act, a partnership is resident. This is very important because uh, taxation of partnerships is on our syllabus. This is important for you to understand that a partnership is resident for the year of income 
if the partners or at least one of those partners was resident during that year of income under consideration. Next, we have the resident retirement fund, and of course, this is in section number 13. They're saying that uh, a resident retirement fund, the resident person for their income, if it is organized under the laws of Uganda, uh, it's operated for the principal purpose of providing retirement benefits for resident individuals, and then three, has its management and control if aside in Uganda. Uh, at any time during the year of income. So we've been talking about year of income, year of income, year of income. What is this all about? Uh, in this slide, you're saying that the year of income is a period of 12 months, ideally beginning from 1st of July and in 30th of June. Income tax is charged for each year of income. A taxpayer may, however, apply to the Commissioner General to use any other period of 12 months other than the normal year of income. So the normal year of income is the fiscal year of income, which should be, be, as you have seen, beginning 1st of July and ending 30th of June. Then you have what you call a substituted year of income, and they're saying that according to Section 39, Subsection 1, a substituted year of income is a period of 12 months other than the normal year of income which runs from 1st of July to 30th of June. So for those companies which have financial years stretching from 1st of January to 31st of December, what they have is what we call the uh, substituted year of income. <laughs> then we have a transitional year of income. And you say that where the taxpayer changes his year of income either from the normal year of income to a substituted year of income or from a substituted year of income to a normal year of income, they are given a period of 12 months or a period of, of, of a full year uh, prior to the change and the date on which the change the year of income commences is treated as a separate year of income to be known as a substituted year of income. So yeah, if you're changing from the normal year of income to a uh, substituted year of income, or from the substituted year of income to the normal year of income, uh, the law gives you uh, <clears throat> a period of 12 months so, so that you can change your books of accounts, you can change, you can do a number of ad uh, amendments so that you can now smoothly move into uh, the normal year or, uh, in, or to, towards the substituted year of income. So that allowance, the allowance of 12 months is what we call uh, our transitional year of income. All right, so that was our presentation for today. And I encourage you to now move into employment income because now we have started the real, real income tax now. Don't forget to have your, your uh, don't forget to have your income tax act ready and please get the updated income tax act. For now, I remain innocent and vicious. Thank you.